Okay, so it's panel, panel time. Uh, Avnish needs no introduction because he's already up on stage and we've met him. Uh, we have a few others to bring up though. So first, can I have to the stage please, Lata Seti. So Lata is a venture, Lata is a venture capital investor. So we've got a range, we've got uh, Avnish who's moved from running his own companies to invest in. We have angel investors as well. And we might, uh, I, what I'm going to do is ask um, each investor to tell us what they do, is a, what the difference is between those. So Lata, please take a seat. Uh, next, can we have Helen Chorley, who has, is a, an angel investor? <laughs> Helen. And finally, our last panelist, Anna Bruno, to the stage, please. Another angel investor. Um, just running through, in terms of the types of investors we have, quickly starting with Anna at the end, angel investor. What does angel investor mean? Angel investor means to uh, be diligent about um, choosing your investments and choosing your investments wisely. And just to back it up for a minute, uh, besides being an angel investor, I'm also a licensed financial planner and a consultant in the United States. And I'm known as the, um, my client's money doctor. So that's my nickname, is the client's money doctor. Fantastic, thank you. And Helen, anything, and to add to that, introduce yourself and also anything to add on an angel investor and what that sure. means for you. Absolutely. Uh, hi, lovely to be with you. Uh, so I'm a property and an angel investor. And angel investing for me is kind of a very early stage investor in companies, in startups. So I have a number of those across um, tech, prop tech, th those type of things. Um, I'm a former investment banker, so I'm finance background as well. So the investing kind of came naturally. It's, it's something I've always done for being a child. I had 10 bank accounts by the age of 10. So I've <laughs> always been obsessed. With, with money and making money and wealth. So that's my background. Great. So we've met Avanish, and you did touch on investment in investing in your, in your um, presentation. But how would you define yourself as an investor? What kind of investor are you? A bit of a novice. <laughs> um, so I've just been investing outside of the business for the last few years. Uh, so still learning the ropes. Uh, mm. I've got various investments with lot, some of the friends in our room, for example. You're going to hear from Jeff later on. I've invested in his uh, fund, his and uh, Reese's, which is his son, their fund. And what I tend to look for, because I'm not a, uh, an expert this yet, I tend to invest in people rather than just the product itself. I look at the person and I think, is this the kind of person that I want to invest in? Do they have the integrity, the values that, uh, um, that align with mine? And that's a big factor in that, as well as you know, what they're going to be doing as well. Fantastic. And then Lata, our, our venture capitalist, our VC. Please say a few words about you and what, what, is, what are you as a VC? How would you define a VC? Sure, happy to. Uh, Lata Seti from San Francisco. Um, so what our fund does is invest in female founders and the difference between a, female, a venture capital firm and an angel investment, angel is very early as they have shared and many times it's a direct investment from the investor to the startup founder and the company while venture capital is more a professional investment firm and so we invest other people's money and those other people who invest money in our fund are called LPs or limited partners. So you have a broader fund and you make decisions based on extensive due diligence of the company. And a lot of times the angel investors, you have a relationship or they have a domain expertise in a particular industry. So venture comes much, much later than angel investment. Okay, carrying on then. Thinking about that later, that later stage, what are the top three things, what are the three factors you're looking for when deciding to make an investment? What gets, gets someone to a yes? Uh, great question. Um, generally speaking, what we find, especially with female founders, when they pitch us for um, fundraising, a lot of times they spend you know, the majority of that pitching time talking about the problem talking about the, you know, the demographic or their targeted market and, um, you know, don't have enough time then to talk about a solution to the problem. Um, 
if you imagine like Shark Tank or Dragon's Den, that's exactly what we do, except we're all female investors, investing in female founders. And our particular fund we built to um, guess how much of the billions of dollars that goes to venture capital investments in firms, how much of that percentage wise goes to female led companies? Five, two. Uh, you got it right almost. 1.9% of venture capital goes to female-led companies, and a majority of those females tend to be um, Caucasian women who went to Harvard or Trinity or Wharton, and 0.5% goes to women of color-led companies, and that includes, you know, Asian, Indian, African-American, etc., and then 0.1%, sorry, 0.1% to African-American women. So our fund was created to address that inequity, and so the things we look for is one, you know, what is the solution to this critical problem they're solving? You know, most founders are, of course, very committed and loyal to their idea, but we also look at, are the founders coachable? If we as investors come on board and we've had years of experience, are they open to shifting their idea, to molding the idea? Because you know, 85 to 90% of a business plan that's created gets transformed or changed in the first 18 months of having a company. And the third thing we look for is, you know, do they have any kind of expertise, a domain expertise or an industry background in the area they're starting for the company? So do they bring knowledge to the table? And, um, you know, lastly, are they confident? Do they feel like they're energized and passionate? Because I think especially the majority of you who are founders here are female. Um, I think we all wait and wait to get the idea right, to get the idea perfect, to get the business plan and pitch just right before we launch. So um, one big thing we look for is launch the idea. You can always morph and reiterate and change it because it's going to naturally happen. So those are some of the areas that I think we look yeah. for in successful female founders. Fantastic. Thank you. <clears throat> and then Anna and Helen, as angels, in terms of the three factors, you top three factors you'd look for, how does that differ from what we've just heard uh, Lata saying for a VC? The one I will definitely agree with is the coachable, mm. or the coachability. And actually, kind of implicit in that is the ability to listen. We've all got two ears and we can hear, so we all think we listen well. We don't. <laughs> and that, that's definitely a deciding factor. It, it's one of the top deciding factors, along with um, what you said about kind of values and alignment. But if somebody will listen, if they'll take on your ideas, and absolutely, you know, more than open, that, that's what it's about, having that back and forth. Well, why do you think that and justify that? And then they have to justify themselves. You want that, someone to bounce back off. That's very much why angel investors are brought in as well. It's not just, I don't think we like to be seen as just, you know, a bank account or just a wad of cash. There you go. It's not the way I operate. I assume it's not the way you, you operate either. We come or we're chosen or we're approached because of the expertise that we bring as well. Well, why would you bring us in if you're not going to listen to us? They have to be able to listen. So that's a really critical point for me personally. Fantastic. Anna? And for me, what I would add to everything that was said already is what I personally look for is, uh, is the product or service a unique or special? It's really important. In addition to that, what I personally look for is if it's patented. Really, really important because that's going to make a difference. Uh, among many, many things. I don't know how much time you have. You know, there, there are several other aspects that I look at, but those were the ones that I really wanted to highlight. Thank you. Thank you, Anna. Avanesh, I want to come back to something you mentioned. You said you invest in people. Um, so I was a follow-on to that. How important is, or is it possible for someone to be coming in and looking for investment that is not an expert or, uh, or grounded in the industry that they're trying to start their investment in? How, would you, uh, how would, would you still back a person over their expertise? That's a really good question, Ian. <laughs> um, let me think about what the answer would be. I think often, you know, bearing in mind all the things that have been said earlier, often you're backing the person as opposed to mm. the product because a person that's tenacious and listens and so on will adapt 
the original idea to make it work and the, the final result could be very different yeah. to what they originally started with. And I think that flexibility of not being rigid about, because often um, founders get very rigid. No, I started this, I want it to be like this. And actually, and I've got my own experience of having to flex to be yeah. successful. So I think the key thing is, does that person have the ability that the ego won't get in the way of flexing to make sure that they are ultimately successful and return investment to, right. the, to, the, to the investors? Yeah. Okay. And ego is a huge red flag. I'm sure we'll get onto tips, but ego is a huge red flag. So if you've got one of those, check them at the door before you speak to us. And, and one more thing I just want to add is passion. Are yes. they passionate about their business? Mm. That is a very important teller whether the business will be successful or not. Okay, thank you. And I wanted to add, I'd look at it very much. Um, a lot of times when founders come pitches, I think they feel like, oh, these are the investors. This is the venture firm. They have the money. And so they may feel not on equal par. And at the same time, I think it's a relationship that if you get venture capital investment or even angel investment, it's a relationship that's going to last five, six, seven years. So think of it very much as you're on the same equal footing with your investors. It's like a long-term marriage. There has to be give and take between both sides. So it's a long-term relationship that you have to look at when you're looking at potential investors. Fantastic. Following on and coming in on the point of ego, what other common mistakes do you see? What are the big mistakes that you see people making regularly when they're coming in looking for an investment? Um, I think there's an expectation generally that after a few presentations and pitches to venture firms that you will raise funding. Mm. And the data out there shows that you have to do somewhere between 50 to 70 pitches to raise venture capital. So when you're going in there to make your pitch, rather than looking at it as, yes, I'm going to get funding, look at it as a learning experience. And, you know, because the likelihood of getting funded by that particular pitch is so low. And uh, one thing I'd also recommend for founders, especially if it's their first startups, after you pitch, look at what you've learned. And when you get back to your office or home, make a change in your deck or your presentation. Like, use it as a learning experience. So each time you pitch, you're polishing and getting better. And the likelihood or probability of you getting funding next time increases. So it's that each, you know, you may get a no, but each no is getting you closer to that yes. Absolutely. Oh, fantastic. <clears throat> and then we've talked about founders coming in um, and looking for uh, uh, investment. But presumably, you know, these founders, they're not the only people in the company. When, at the point it's an angel investment, is there, how often is there a team behind them? And how important is the team behind them in getting line of sight onto them? It's, it's absolutely critical um, to the question that you asked Avnish. If, even if the founder themselves doesn't have expertise in that market, who are they surrounded by? Who are their um, advisors? Who else makes up that team? Because the founder can borrow credibility from the people that they surround themselves with. Just on, I would like to just add to the, the, the earlier question about common mistakes that are made as well. I, I wrote, written, if you message me, I, I can send it to you, but I wrote an article about how investing is like dating. It's a two-way thing. It's a conversation, as you, as you said, Letta. And I see people, they, they, they want the money so badly. So they'll do anything. They'll promise anything. They'll take anybody's money. Be very, very, very careful whose money you take. And be very, very careful what you are giving to a fund or to an angel investor in return. You need to interview them to assess their suitability for you as much as they are interviewing you to see if you you know, fit into their portfolio and, and, and you're a good match for them. It's a two-way thing. Make sure you approach it that way. It's to your point also about it being a level playing field. Be very careful whose money you take. That's a fantastic point. So it then becomes less of a pitch and more of a, you know, more like dating in a way. Mm -hmm. um, and I, Anna, uh, adding to that, you know, what are... I just wanted to add something uh, that uh, let's not forget that investments, especially investing in, as an angel investor, it's a long-term strategy. I think sometimes mm. people forget about it and they expect returns quickly. Yeah. And that's something to keep in mind. It's a long-term strategy. Yeah. And so, you know, it's, for me, that's been insightful in that that would, as a, if I was sitting as an investor, 
actually having someone start interviewing me and look at what they can get from me would start turning things into, turn that into a great start. What else, what other factors, Anna, what other factors would make a person in the room stand out and turn what is a, is a good but not great pitch into a great experience from meeting can I, investors? Can I just add something to that? Yeah, um, sure. I think, which I think answers that question and the previous question is, uh, in terms of founders often are good with the ideas. Mm. They've got fantastic ideas. They need doers to often execute those ideas. And that diversity of the people around them, I think, is critical. And, you know, but people around them, their values are aligned. Because mm. often uh, I've seen in, inve in companies where the, invest the, the, sorry, the founder and the people they've put, brought around them, that can all collapse because they're all uh, different value set, uh, they're not all committed, they're not all passionate, uh, and the whole thing can crumble. So it's having the right team around them. That the, 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 the founder could, obviously could be the doer as well, but often they're the ideas people. They need a, a diverse team of people around them. Got it. Got it. Okay. <clears throat> and... Going back to the, um, what makes someone stand out, Anna, have you, what, what else would you think of walking away from that going, that was a great start? That as, a, as an investor or as, yeah. a, as a... As an investor. If as someone, so someone's walked out of your office and you're thinking, that was a great start, let's go where, see where this goes. What, is there any particular factors you could highlight? If I want to invest in their company, that's what... You may not have chosen to invest in them, but you think it may think it's been a great start to the, to the way that your relationship with them is, has gone. Potentially, you're going to get them back and potentially invest in them, but you're, not, you're starting to lean that way rather than... Yeah, so the first and foremost is passion. Does this person have passion or not? Do they have a great team behind them? Uh, third would be the product or service has to be unique and preferably um, patented. Yeah. The fourth would be the financial health of the company. We didn't talk a lot about that, but it's really important. The next time one I would um, um, include would be uh, the legal aspects of the company. Sometimes they forget that you know they they have this great idea or great product, but you know in the country that you're operating in may not make sense. So legalities are very important. And I would say, um, you know, scalability of the product or, or the service. Scalability would be important. Mm. Can I add one thing? You can, because I, I, I was about to follow up with you and oh. ask you what signals that something can scale. Yeah, I think um, knowing your competitors, the competitive landscape, a lot of times people will come talk to us and when you talk to them about who their competitors are, they'd like to say, oh, our product is so unique, there's nothing like that in the market, et cetera, et cetera. And if you are chasing a market where there are no competitors, at least you know, in some level, you're probably not uh, Probably pursuing. not a market. Exactly. <laughs> and... Um, Prior to being on the investor side or the entrepreneur side, I used to be a patent litigator in New York. And patents, as um, I think uh, Anne was saying, is a really great informational source for competitive intelligence. If you go do your research online in any jurisdiction, England included. So uh, knowing who your competitors are, knowing how you are distinct and differentiated in the marketplace is, I think, a critical factor. Fantastic. Can, can I just share a personal story? I just want to, if we have two minutes, um, our last investment that we did as a family, my husband and I, um, I so when I was approached about the investing and I was traveling and I went back home to New York and I told my husband, Michael, that this is the idea that I had, which was to invest in a dating company. <laughs> he was like, what? Why would you want, why would we want to invest in a dating company? But this was not just an any dating company. This was a special dating company. And how was it special? Because this was a dating company that was powered by AI, number one. And their product was patented. And again, I forgot to mention one more also um, aspect that I look at was um, the social impact. What impact would it have on society? And given that we have three children, one of my last is a daughter, and I would love for her to have the ability, and I'm not going to get into all the details of the particular company, but it really allows people to really find their true love through AI. But anyway... Um, What's the name of that? The name... <laughs> uh, Just for a friend. The, na 
the name is called Iris Dating, and it's really, it's, it's interesting. Again, why I chose to invest in it is because it's revolutionary. People, when they download the app, which is free, by the way, they go through special training called Irish training, and they're shown photographs of, let's say, you're a female looking for male or vice versa, whatever. You, you're shown photographs of different people, and then you go, yes, no, maybe, yes, no, maybe. And then the AI starts recognizing what your preferences are. And based on that, it starts recommending people to you. And again, statistically speaking, they're saying that um, women have a lot far less of a chance of finding their true love, and there's different types of love, apparently. And for the re love relationship coaches, probably they know more than I do. There are different types of love. But true love is more than just sexual love or more than just like cuddly love. There's, there's like, it's a lot more than that. So the AI technology recognizes the facial patterns and basically, which I never thought of this, but apparently what we're attracted to is not, I assumed it's based on your skin color or your color of your eyes, and it's not. It's, it's, it's really the, the facial features that you have, and it dates back thousands of years to your ancestors and how your ancestors have chosen. Anyway, so why am I telling the story? This is a personal story of how I chose our last investment. And all the things that I just mentioned were obviously part of the decision-making process. That's fantastic. We're in danger of uh, going back to the health and well-being day yes, uh, that we had yesterday. And I know we, the clock is uh, deep in the red now, so I'm going to close it there. But thank you very much for that insightful panel. I hope that was of value to you out there. It certainly was to me. And I'm going to thank my panelists and say, let's enjoy the rest of the day. Now you can relax. No <laughs> more speaking. Thank you.